Welcome to Aging with Attitude. My name is Anthony Apuru, as you know, and today, um, first up, I want to um, give a mihi to those who have been affected by Cyclone um, Gabriel, um, especially those in the Hawke's Bay. My heart goes out to you. Our heart goes out to you. For those who are missing, I, I pray that things aren't as um, bad that you will be found uh, alive and well. Um, and those who have lost lots, the farmers, um, shop owners, produce, all those who have lost, um, my heart goes out to you and, and we pray that we can help revive our um, our nation uh, of beautiful Aotearoa. So Ketimi Kia Koto, um, for those who have lost um, loved ones, you know, again, um, my sympathies go out to you as well. And we just want to, as a community, just support you and lift you up in this time of um, not only need, but loss and despair. So, Kate uh, Mihi, Kate Mihi, Kate Mihi, Kia Koto. Um, today, guys, we have a some guests in the studio today. Um, but first, I need to tell you that um, the topic we're going to talk about is surviving sexual abuse. And so that could cause some of our listeners some um, being triggered. <clears throat> and if that happens, you know, I would encourage you uh, to contact someone to support you, um, whether it's um, family or um, professionals. In the Wairarapa, there are different counselling services here. There is changeability as well. And also um, pathways could possibly help depends on how you get triggered. Also, um, those who are talking with us today, and I'll let them introduce themselves to you, uh, they can give you uh, their contact details as well if you need some support. Uh, but in saying that, uh, welcome, welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. <coughs> um, so your name? My name's Tony and I work for The Road Forward. My name's Taylor, I work for The Road Forward. And kia ora, my name's Susan and I work with you, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I wonder how that ever happened and why I can survive a year or two years now. On to number three. On to number three, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome everyone and thanks for having us. Hopefully uh, your trip here today was uh, uneventful. You're here, so must have been. Must have been. It was a, like the sunset over the hill was stunning. So we just kind of cruised into uh, Marsden <laughs> and the Wai Rapper. It's fantastic. It is usually a place for myself. Um, there are two places coming over that hill where the valley opens up. Yeah, right. And that's when I know I'm home. Yeah. When I see that view, of I'm home. Yeah. You know, and, and it is a beautiful sight. You know what did surprise me is the amount of people going the opposite direction mm -hmm. like into the into the Hart Valley. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, the, the trains we have early morning trains, commuter trains. There are three of them. Um, I think five fifty is the first one. Six twenty is the next one, and six fifty fifty is the the last one. Oh. And there are heaps of. I think there's about nine carriages in the first one. Wow. And Usually it's standing room. Yeah, once you pass Featherston, you're in your stands. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a ton of people going over. That's besides those who travel on car. Mm. And usually, because I did it for 11 years <laughs> on the car, mm. um, all train and car, usually if you're going over a car um, from Kaitoki, you're going slow from Kaitoki. Mm. Yeah, I was going to Purirua, so it take me usually about two hours ten to get from here to Purirua. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and then just over an hour and a half coming back. Yeah, yeah, but it was crazy. If you don't leave early enough, you're stuck. Take your lunch. <laughs> It's interesting, eh? Because I think we've had so many new housing developments in the Wairarapa or in Masterton and Carterton as well. Um, so a lot of those have probably come over from Wellington to get away from the rat race, maybe, and but are still having to commute down there every day, which is um, quite quite a tough trip, isn't it? Really, it can be very traumatising at times, especially <laughs> if the uh, trains, especially in the summertime. Usually, it takes an hour 40 to get to Wellington Station, coming home, if it's hot, then there's um, speed restrictions on the train, or even going over, if there's a certain amount of people standing, then there's speed restrictions as well, so it makes the day longer. Yeah, so I know for myself, if I was going from here to Purirua, because I, I worked at Whitiria, uh 
on train it would take just over five hours a day traveling wow it's wow. crazy huh? yeah yeah well two hours into wellington then half an hour from wellington to purirua right, there's some serious commitment <laughs> <laughs> yeah crazy <laughs> yeah yeah but anyway um so you we did you said you work for the road going for road forward road forward yeah. tell us about the road forward when was it started what was this how did it so the um, road forward provides peer support services to adult survivors of sexual harm okay and so we don't usually use abuse or violence because mm -hmm. it's too limiting um so we use harm so it covers a broader range of of trauma-based um uh, situations and events um it started in 2010 so it's been okay. going yeah, you know, nearly 20 years. Um, but we are funded to do like Kapiti, Wairapa, and so we're, we're trying to branch out into the regional areas more okay. and have more of a presence. Um, so in, in regards to the services that we offer, we do uh, primary services, one-on-one uh, -on -one peer support and then group peer support. And so we've got offices in Kapiti, Wellington, obviously here in Marston, and then also in the hut. And so we do individual, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions and then we also do group sessions as well one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions peer, well we don't call them counseling but mm -hmm. it's, it's peer support so okay. essentially for those that may not understand what peer support is it's about the lived experience okay. of a person so everyone that works for the agency has been sexually harmed in some way so that they have an understanding and a lived experience mm. of what sexual harm is for them to support our clients, we don't like calling them them, but the people that use our services. Um, whereas a lot of people that may be in other fields have the academic understanding, but not the lived experience. And so okay. we very much try and tap into the lived experience to support. Okay. Yeah. So um, in terms of your your location here in the Wadarapa, yeah, so we're, we are working out of the Wairapa Community Centre, which is on Perry Street. Okay. Yeah, yeah so yeah. every Monday at the moment, and let's cross the fingers that the funders are going to give us more money. Yeah, yeah. And then we uh, will get an actual dedicated peer worker here um, part-time. So if anyone's out there, wants a job, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, every Monday, we're committed to being here until that opens up a bit more. Okay. Um, so... Um, how do they get in contact with you? So the easiest way is to jump on the website. Um, okay. So we're on all social media platforms, but it's www.theroadforward and there's just the contact page and that literally comes and sits in front of my, you know, my email box so yep. I get it straight away. Um, or they can contact us through Facebook, which is the same again, The Road Forward, or Instagram is the same thing. Okay, yeah, the reason why I said that people are so that as I said, um, something could be triggered in yourself. So that's the way that you could get in contact with the road forward. Absolutely, yeah. and we have a we have a policy within the agency that if someone contacts us, someone has contacted them within four hours. Okay, cool. Um, so can you give those addresses again? Just yeah, yeah. So it's um, the website is www.theroadforward.org.nz. Org.nz. <laughs> um, Facebook. What's Facebook, Taylor? Facebook.com backslash the road forward and then instagram instagram is instagram.com backslash the road forward underscore nz there you have it there you go there you <laughs> have it nice and, <laughs> nice and easy good work <laughs> so all of those like literally on my phone now i can pick up my phone and we, we've all got access to all of it so any one of us will answer or reply within four hours of, of any way of contacting us. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That is so quick. Yeah. That, and there is no um, waiting list? No waiting list, and it's all free. It's all free. So that's all even better. Of the, all of the services that we offer are free. There's no cost for anything. Yeah. Um, you know, thanks to the beautiful Labor Department who, who fund us. Um, yeah, there's no cost. Okay. No waiting lists. No waiting lists. Yeah. Okay. Have you... Um, this one here is normally, um, your service is usually for men, is that correct? So in Wire Wrapper at the moment, we're men only. The other regions that we work in, it's gender inclusive. Mm. I shouldn't be saying this live, but hopefully by April of this year, our funding will include uh, the Wire Wrapper for us to become gender inclusive so that we can do everyone. But at the moment, for the Wire Wrapper region, it's men only. 
Okay, so um, a question in terms of if there are some ladies out there who need some help, where would you suggest or give me advice where to go to? <laughs> Contact us anyway, um, because <laughs> what we can do, you know, with the miracle of technology, we can zoom it. Okay. So we can actually put them in contact with our female peer workers, which, you know, over the hill, but we can still do it via Zoom. And so there, there are still ways that we can support them. It may not be necessarily physical face-to-face, -face, mm. but we can still provide services for them in, in other ways. And then the minute that funding clicks in, it changes, and then we can do face-to-face. -face. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That is so good. I'm all about no barriers. Like, nothing gets in my yeah, way yeah. If, if someone needs help, then... Yeah, it's quite interesting for me because usually um, the funding is for the ladies, mm -hmm. and where this one seems to be flipped on its head. Yeah, oh, it's interesting because as of today, so the embargo got lifted today, um, Ministry of Social Development just released the new, new stats for New Zealand. Okay. So for men, one in, six, uh, one in six men are sexually harmed by the age of 16. Wow. And then for women, one in four women are sexually harmed by the age of 16. And statistically, it's always been suggested that men are the perpetrators, women are the victims. And the new stats that have just come out is that 30 percent of all perpetrators are female mm -hmm. and so the statistics are starting to flip um, which is why the funding criteria is changing because obviously traditionally the funding went to females because yes. they were the most at risk but now it's becoming really clear that men are at the same level of risk and so the services and the funding are opening up for that as well that's crazy you know 30 percent yeah uh, woman perpetrators. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's crazy. And the, the reason it doesn't get talked about is because often it's, you know, female to male, and then with men that are being perpetrated by females, it starts to challenge their version of masculinity. Yeah. And of course, you know, how can a woman abuse someone that's of a male body? Mm. Well, it's really easy, actually, in, this, in the same way as reverse. It's just done in a different way. And of course, men... There's so much shame around it okay. and so much stigma that they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I, it's shame and stigma is who would want to be identified as. Right. Yeah. It's... Mm. Totally. It's I mean, crazy. you know, even, I mean, my assault was two men. So I was just turned 15 years old when my assault happened. Mm. To most people, that's logical, you know, male on male. Mm. But when it's reversed to female to male, that, that, that it just doesn't click with people because mm. the narrative has always been male to female or male to male. Mm. And now the narrative is changing. So, mm. it's And I suppose part of that also would be um, underreporting the stats. So the statistics that we had, which, you know, came out technically today, so, you know, fresh off, fresh off the thing, um, the statistics that we have is reported only and they suggest that actually it's double what it is and that's globally as well so globally they say mm. the same thing that it's actually probably double the amount that's actually recorded mm. um, i saw a, a funny clip well, it wasn't funny um but it was on youtube it was one of those reality talk shows mm. yeah and um there's this um male he was saying that he was locked in this apartment mm -hmm. by his girlfriend mm -hmm. And he had to, to escape, he had to jump from three stories um, out of the, off the balcony. Yeah. Well, the, um, the audience started laughing at him, you know. Yeah. And then the host said, why are you laughing? If this was a female, you would want this person captured yeah. and taken to yeah. detention. So f with our clients, I think it's 39% of our male clients have been perpetrated by someone in a female body. Wow, that's a lot. It just never gets talked about. Yeah. Um, and that's a, it's, a, it's a really old narrative. It's centuries of narrative that mm. are playing out here mm. um, that, you know, men are the perpetrators. It's, all, it's been a narrative for centuries. But, of mm. course, now that narrative is, is turning... You know, um, that actually all of us have it within us, male and female. Mm. 
And I, I just think now it's becoming more commonplace to actually name it. Mm. Um, and, and even though there's still a lot of shame and stigma around it, it's still being, at least it's being named now. Mm. And the reports from government are coming through to actually validate mm. that the narrative is changing. Mm. Why do you think um, men are starting to speak up now? Well, actually, men aren't speaking up in the way that we would like them to, mm -hmm. still generally. So statistics that, are, you know, the same ones from the same source have come out that it takes 20 years from the event for someone in a male body to disclose. Okay. And then for someone in a female body, nine years to disclose. Yep. Um, and if you're talking about um, the rainbow community, often there's no disclosure. Oh, okay. Because there's double disclosure, so there's sexuality disclosure and then there's sexual harm disclosure and mm. most of them don't disclose at all. Mm. And so the statistics for the, you know, the rainbow community, are even, uh, it's suggested that they're even higher, but, but they're not disclosed on the same level. Mm. But yeah, so, so in general, 20 years for someone in a male body to disclose. Mm. Um, and if that first disclosure is not successful, or something happens, or they, like you were saying, you know, someone laughs at them for something, mm. then it can often take another 20 years before they come back and readdress it. Mm. So, you know, typical Kiwi men, close it all down, I'm tough, don't want to talk about it, don't need mm. support, don't need help, and just keep trucking along. Mm. But then what happens is, is all of these behaviours end up happening along the side of it, and the report that just came out that every single person that's sexually harmed, 11 people are all are affected by that with that person. So husbands, wives, children, grandchildren, uncles, mm. aunts, whānau, you know, and so 11 pe people per individual mm. is affected in some way because of that sexual harm. Mm. So it's massive amounts of people that are being affected by one event mm. and most people don't want to talk about it. Mm. No one wants to say that, you know, my uncle or my aunt or my father or my cousin did what they did mm. because that one thing is then going to ripple through that family and cause major distress. Yeah. Mm. That's interesting you say that because, like, now I'm only thinking out loud. Mm? You're the expert on this. Let's okay. think out loud. I'm not. But um, I'm thinking if you have a perpetrator in a family, mm -hmm. right, more than likely there'd be more than one victim, right. more than likely. Yeah. You know, and I said, I'm just guessing. But then if you have those, um, say, let's say three people were harmed in an extended family. Mm -hmm. So you're talking 33 people now. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, no, you're not talking 33. You're actually t talking 36 people because mm -hmm. you've got the individual plus the 11. Mm -hmm. So 36 people doesn't take long to affect the whole family in some way. <coughs> And then you're talking about generational, you know, like, in, like in my family, yep. it's generational, you know, sexual harm is generational. Yeah. Um, and so generation after generation, and like my nephews and nieces, so, you know, my brother's kids, we all made a commitment near again. Yeah. And so that entire line of my nephews and nieces have never been touched. Mm. And so the hope is moving forward, we have all broken the generational, you know, harm yeah. form of thing going on. Um, but you're right, it just it just keeps moving through. And then in a situation like you're talking about, no one wants to talk about it. Mm. Um, you know, we have a lot of stuff that we do for Māori. You know, we originally were like, well, let's go to the marae. And then feedback from Māori was like, you can't do this here mm. because the aunties and uncles are going to hear about it, the gossip's going to start happening, and we had to take it off the marae and bring it into like our offices. Mm because the people that we were dealing with at the time didn't feel safe to have the kōrero, which we would assume that, you know, as a European male, I was like, well, let's go to the marae and do it. And they were like, no, 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 let's go away from here, take it off, mm. then deal with it, and then we can come back mm. know, from there. Yeah, it's it's huge. Massive. It, it is huge. As you said, in terms of generational, because that behaviour is a, or is a, well, it seems to be a learned behaviour, so you learn that you're getting abused, but also you learn to hide things. Yeah. Yeah, and cover them up. Honestly, my friend, one of the biggest things that we deal with is isolation. Mm -hmm. And it's not just isolation as a social event, but it's, in, you know, the internalised isolation. Mm -hmm. So most survivors 
uh, stop communicating, uh, stop having family events, stop going to family events, stop going to social events, because their nervous system is in hyper alert. And you know, if it's a family situation, they don't want to go to a family event because the perpetrator might be there, mm. so they stay home, or they might be at someone's party and they don't want to go because that person is going to be there, and so they just end up isolating more and more and more and more and more. And often it's yeah. not until they come in front of one of us and they speak about it, and then looking at us, going, well, because on all our social media profiles it says that we're all we're all survivors in our own right, mm. and so they're sitting in front of someone who not only has been sexually harmed actually believes them so there's no doubt in our mind that the situation happened mm. and then they can actually go and then they all, all of a sudden they breathe it out I mm. was sexually harmed and it just all of a sudden it just starts all coming out mm. and for most of them it's the first time they've actually been able to voice it mm. in, a, in a situation where they haven't had to keep it in for so long, you know. Mm. It's, again, it's that 20 year cycle, you know. Mm. Holding on to a secret for 20 years is a long time. It's mm. two decades, you know. Mm. Um, and still, you know, one of our biggest things is early prevention, early disclosure. Mm. And e every single day we're dealing with people, you know, when did it happen? 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I mean, what am I? I'm 53 years of two weeks ago. And mine happened when I was 15. Mm. And I didn't disclose until I was in my mid-30s. Mm. You know, 15 years. Yeah, I was just thinking, well, as you were talking then, um, a little bit different, but on the same line, um, about hypervigilance mm -hmm. and the amount of cortisol that would be released into the system every day. Every day. Every day. Every single day. Yeah. So hypervigilance for survivors is one of the main things. So, and, and obviously there's, you know, there's flight, fright, fawn, flop, and there's all those nervous system responses. Mm. But hypervigilance is massive with survivors. And, you know, I was talking about the rainbow community before. For the rainbow community, double disclosure, sexuality and sexual mm. harm, the hypervigilance stops them from actually coming to us because it's actually too much for them to mm. do it twice. Um, but basically you have survivors that will turn up in a room and they're scanning for safety the whole time because they feel unsafe. Mm. And most survivors spend their whole lives feeling unsafe in social environments mm. and are constantly monitoring what's going on in each situation. Mm. And like even I do it now, every now and then I catch myself and I walk into a room and I'm like, where's the escape route? just in case I need to get out. Yeah, yeah. Um, or if I walk into an environment that I'm not familiar with, mm. sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll pull back so I'm not as vulnerable as I would normally be, mm. you know, but for me, you know, the biggest thing is that the level of vulnerability I show then shows up in front of me, but I still have moments where I'm like, I don't feel safe to do this mm. for, you know, whatever reasons that are going through, you know, years of that program running within me. Well, that's right. It's it's that program. Yeah. It's their program. So part of my thinking is in terms of um, being hypervigilant, plus also the uh, amount of cortisol that's going into the system, I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, where's the rest for this person? Yeah, there is, yeah, there is no rest. Yeah, and so what is happening in that person's body in terms of mental health? in terms of fatigue, in terms of just being or able to be, to function. They don't, and I'm only guessing, and you can help me out mm -hmm. here, my thoughts are they don't know what normal is because of what's happened to them. If, uh, yeah, uh, listen, I completely agree with you. If, if you talk of a child that was sexually abused, you know, sex, child sexual abuse, their innocence was stolen. And so from that point on, they, li they live a lifestyle, a life of nervous system breakdown, mental health, anxiety, depression, drugs and alcohol, and then lots of other things come out of that. You know, my, I mean, my story alone, like I threw myself, so I was sexually harmed at 15. I was then made homeless, then became a sex worker 
And to be able to deal with that, I became a, a serious drug addict. Mm. And then for 15 years was on the needles and all the rest of it. I mean, and back in the, I mean, I'm going back in the 80s and 90s here. Thank God there was no pee. I think I'd probably be dead if there was. Mm. Um, but I, the, I spent probably 15 years and then had to go into rehab mm. and then had to start unpacking why do I have anxiety and why do I have depression mm. and and why am I using drugs so heavenly to, to escape my emotions mm. and it, it, everything just kept pointed back to that one situation mm. so a lifetime and you know even though I'm in my 50s now I still have to be mindful of, of depression outbreaks I still have to be mindful of anxiety you know I still have to be mindful that if I'm in an environment where there's alcohol uh, you know, there's potential, especially if my state's not in a good space of like, I need to remove myself from this. Mm. And so even at 53, and even though I disclosed, you know, 30 years or 25 years ago, whenever it was, I'm still monitoring every single day. What's my state? How's my state? And with the team at work, because all of us are survivors, they're our first point of contact. And so we have a really unique work environment where people can text in and say, I'm vulnerable today or I'm not managing today. Mm. And we give them as much flexibility to be able to, to navigate their mental health without the pressure of nine to five being in the office. Mm. So we have flexi time, they can work from home, they can do it however it works for them mm. to make sure that their mental health is looked after first. Because okay. every single person that works in our agency has some form of mental health issues. Yeah. Addiction issues, um, you name it across the board we have it within our agency mm. and so if we can't support our team we're not going to be able to support yeah, it yeah it's if you, you can't support the team right then that's it you're gone yeah right you're gone yeah so yeah. all the traditional hierarchy of of a normal agency of nine to five and you know top down hierarchy etc etc has all been eliminated mm. and it's just like everyone sits in a staff meeting and you know, regardless of age, qualification, academic achievements or whatever, we're all peer workers mm. that have been sexually harmed, mm. all in this together. Mm. And then the rest of it just disappears. Yep. So I want to pick up on a few things, mm -hmm. okay? So in terms of um, the groups, yeah. as we've talked about, and we've laid a, a, quite a broad platform really about what happens to a person who is um, sexually harmed. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to talk a bit more about um, the things that you do in terms of your peer support and your uh, peer support groups. Because yeah. um, from my perspective, um, and you just stated that beautifully there where you can ring up and say, hey, I'm not feeling good today. And your workers go, cool, just, you know, yeah. we, we, if you need us, we're here. Yeah. What do you need? Yeah. Okay. So it's really about um, talking about what you do in those uh, peer support groups so that a person can feel safe. Yep. You know, how do you lift their way to her? So what we do, like, you know, our tagline is empowering survivors of sexual harm. And so the key word for me out of all of that is empowerment. Mm. Everything else kind of sits, sits by the side. So everything that we do is client-centered and trauma-informed. So our groups, even though you know, Taylor and I might be facilitating technically, the groups aren't about us. And so the group processes, the group agreements, who's in the group, you know, conflict within the group is dealt with by the entire team of people. Um, Can I just stop you there yeah, first? Yeah. So um, do you have, when you start to draw up your group, mm -hmm. Do you have sessions before that individually to see? Yeah. So what happens is no one comes into our, our group until they've gone through a minimum of six one-on-one -on -one sessions. Okay. And then they're vetted mm -hmm. discreetly about whether or not we will then invite them into the group. And then before they get invited, we talk to the group members, say, hey, I've got a new uh, peer that's interested in joining group this is what they're about this is a bit of their background and they're always asked first if we can do this on their behalf yep. and then the group decides and then basically the personal might come in for one or two we'll do a bit of a how does it feel how does it fit and then we'll, we'll move from there um, before they come in there's boundaries and consent there's agreements that they have to sign mm. um, there's agreements that we 
are constantly reviewing depending on how the group is evolving and moving. So, I mean, in the last eight months, I think we've reviewed our group agreements four times. And each of the groups in each of the areas is slightly different depending on... Yeah, different people. Different people, right? And yeah. so as, as much as it would be easier for me to put, you know, carbon copy, let's all do it that way, we break that entire model and go, okay, so Capity, uh, uh, the woman who runs our Capity office, Leslie, she does it her way. You've got Nick in Wellington, he runs it his way. Taylor does the Hutt Valley, he runs it his way. And so the the peer workers are supported within the framework that we work in to create it in the way that they need it for their group members and if a group member says hey I want this and this and can we introduce this then we, we move to accommodate the needs of the group and how it so it's constantly evolving and moving mm. um, and that's for safety um, so you know, we, uh, all the team are trained in you know multiple different areas so that they can keep everyone's safe. Cause, I mean, even when I first started, I walked into our first group and I was so nervous because I'm like, I'm in a strange environment, strange group, strange group dynamic, different to what I'm used to. And it was, and like basically Taylor, I think he was facilitating it. He was like, mm. read out the group agreements, introduced me, made sure that I was comfortable. There's no pressure to share. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole thing of, like, if you want to share, it's up to you. So everything we do is client-centred, but there's a whole process that goes discreetly in the background, keeping everyone safe. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds really good yeah. in terms of um, not having one model that you work from. One model doesn't fit no. survivors at all like, you know in capity for example you know you know i can proudly say that all of a sudden we've come from men only to being gender inclusive but in the capity office we have a dozen females who are like we don't want to be with the men mm. we want to we want a woman's only group yeah and so we created a woman's only group yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we've so we've got a woman's only group and then we've got a mixed gender group in capity because that's what they wanted yeah and so we're like okay well if that's what you want well then we've got the resources to provide it here you go yeah um we do art therapy classes as well you know as, as, as an example and so we presented it to everyone and said this is what we're going to do and then four of the members who are wanting to join the art therapy group went it's too much for me to be in a, a group of 12. Can we do private ones? And so we just reshuffled it, mm. had eight people in the main group and then four people in a little group to accommodate those that mm. were, I'm, I'm not comfortable being in a bigger space. Yeah. So we just molded it to make it work for them. And now we've got two art therapy groups running. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what they wanted. I suppose the question is, well, why can't we? Exactly. What's stopping us? Nothing. And it's not about the people that you work with. It's actually about the organisation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the main thing for us is, you know, you could look at us on the outside and we're just like every other agency in the world, but uh, we try really hard to make everything about our clients mm. and everything is client focused. It's not about what we want. Mm. It's not about what we need, but within that, it's about what we need as a team. Yep. But actually our main priority is what do our clients, what do our members need? What do they need out of this? And if it, if it means us coming to Wire why Rapper every Monday, and that's what we do because we've got people that need us here. So, okay, we'll get in the car and we'll come. Mm. You know, it doesn't, because we're being funded for it. So, so we break down as many of the limitations and barriers as possible. Mm -hmm. And for us, like, if there's a barrier on the way, okay, what can we do to get rid of that barrier? Yep. What yeah. can we do? Like, if someone needs to self referral, now most agencies have forms up the wazoo that you have to fill out. Ours is as simple as either a phone call. I'll meet you in an hour, or you can jump on our website and just fill out the contact form and it will hit my desk. Yeah. And I'll be like, hi. Da, 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 da. Mm. Um, and if it cut, because it's obviously it's a different email address rather than my personal one, the minute we see it, it's like client, everything else stops. Da, 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 da. Mm. What do you need? How can we help? What are we doing? Yeah. What do you want? It's, uh, I like that. I'm going to change the word client. <laughs> Um, just slightly hate, it, okay. hate the word client. Uh, just, just in that scenario though, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was um, for me. It's oh, if someone needs help. Yeah, I help. Yeah, 
so that's when it stops because someone needs you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen, we were at the Patoni Fair in the weekend, and we had a, a young woman just beeline into our tent and just dropped to her knees crying. Mm. And it was literally like the entire team just went mm. and dropped to the floor with her mm. to support her because the night before she'd been sexually harmed by someone. Mm. And so every conversation stopped and it was just focus on her, gave her the support she needed and we, you know, we started to slowly peel off, but mm. it was all about her in that moment. Yeah, um, that's great. Today someone's taking her to the police so that she can do a report and all the rest of it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm going to change focus slightly. I love that. Okay, change just, away. just slightly. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you talked about going on the marae and they said, oh, taihua, taihua. Yeah. <laughs> Not a good thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, but in all the stories, it's heavy. Yeah. Right? All the stories are heavy. And so my thoughts are, okay then, you're in a room where all these stories happen. How do you, at the end, because you've got all this heaviness, how, you, how do you deal with that heaviness? How do you disperse it so people can walk out not feeling... Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah, but coming out, great. I've learned something here. Yeah. I can apply this to my life right now, mm -hmm. and so that they come out being, as you said before, empowered, yeah. instead of being caught still in that heaviness. Yeah, totally. And it's a two-way stream actually, because it's us as team members, mm. and then and then mm. for the people that are coming, every single meeting or group that we have finishes off with something that we're grateful for, something that we're positive for, or there's been a learning thread that runs through it. So like a behaviour or something that people can learn from, and then they take tools from that to then go out. Uh, all of the peer workers are there for a, an hour after our groups in case anyone needs immediate support. And there's always two of us at every meeting, and so if someone's been triggered in the moment, we can then take them into one of our counselling rooms and, and okay, yep. deal with that, and then the, 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 the meetings or the groups it carries on. Carries on. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're all told um, that they can contact us at any time over the next few hours or the next day and come in and have one-on-ones with us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's co we're constantly making sure that they know that we're available to have the conversations and to talk. Um, I'll give you an example at the moment. I've got a client that's here from the Wairapa who's currently in the far north and he's texting me every day. That's what he needed. He's just like, I just need to know that you're there. I like that. Yes. I just need to know that you're there. I just need to know you're there. Yeah. And can I call you if I get stuck? Absolutely. So that's the agreement that we've... And every day he texts me, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm just driven through Taupo. How's your day going? And for him, it's, it's about having a connection with someone. Mm. It's not going to judge him or, you know, like judge his, what he's going through in his emotional state. Just so he knows that someone's there. And then when he gets to the far north, we're going to arrange a Zoom meeting. Be like, hey, how's it going? Just mm. whatever we can do to make sure that our, I hate the word clients, but so that our clients feel that like that we're there for them, basically, mm. rather than just a, a random face behind a, a phone or a keyboard mm. that they never see. We're actually building relationships with them as they go through their journey, because we're going through a journey with them, mm. and our own journey is still continuing, so it's just the two of us on a journey together, you know. I just I was just <laughs> thinking of the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just the two of us. Yeah. And we'll be still be travelling on I'm not <laughs> singing but that's the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um because it led me to something else. Yep. It led me to um for some reason and I don't know what the reason is, we've seemed to as a uh, society, you know, have our own little boxes. Okay. Um, this isn't the same, but it's similar. There was an ad on TV where this lady's house light was on. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that one? No. The um, next door neighbour, he goes, Dear, uh, have you seen Jean today? I have seen it, actually. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, 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 I haven't. But her lights are still on. And then that night, 
You know, he still hadn't seen it, was worried about it. So he ended up going to see what was wrong and she was unwell. Yeah, yeah. really unwell. Yeah. And so connectedness, being there for each other, right. not judging. So, okay, you've, you've got a mawiwi, you've been unwell or something. Then how, how do I help you? Mm. For me, it's getting back to the basics of life, really. And being concerned about each other yeah. instead of building my own empire. Yeah, where I only see my, actually, when I build my own empire, I only see my brick walls, really. Yeah. I don't see anything else because yeah. that's what I'm focused on. But um, it reminds me also, I'm always reminded of different things. So, hey, <laughs> yeah. The story of the selfish giant. Yeah. Yeah. Where he built a wall so the children can come in to his garden. Yeah. And then a child came in through the garden, through the wall, and he knocked down the wall and he said, the children are the most beautiful flowers in the world. And it's the same for people. Mm. People are the most beautiful flowers. Yeah. And how we tend our garden, and it's the garden of the world, is actually all in our community. Let's put it to our community. If we tend our garden well in the community, people flourish. If we tend not to um, tend our garden, I'll use this as an example, even a rose left running wild can be a, a bush of just thorns. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But how do we tend the garden? Yeah. By actually caring about it. Easiest way. Oh, you're absolutely right. You know, for, for me, it's an, a, such a privilege to be able to sit in front of somebody and with them and share stories mm. and one of the things that we do in the agency and it came up last over the last couple of years is we can't help people behind our computers we have to get out there and get on the streets and, and go and meet and greet and talk and so yes our computers are great and it you know helps us do the job that we need to do but actually we need to kind of put our computers down and actually walk out of our offices and go and meet other agencies, other providers, other mm. people, and start talking. Because mm. we can't help anyone behind a desk. No. And, but, and that example of you having um, that meeting yesterday, or, you know, yeah. that young lady, it's um, giving other people the opportunity. Just, you know, if you're feeling vulnerable right there and then, it's great just to be able to walk in yeah. and do it. Otherwise, you, you know, you, um, everything gets, um, you know, they, they pull away and, and do the isolation and all that sort of stuff and it just it just builds up their own they build up their own walls don't they yep. so yeah that's awesome a great story Thanks. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it won't take you nine years no it that's won't. right no yeah. that's the point right it's yeah such a waste of life isn't yeah, it yeah. So honestly the, the the quicker people disclose the faster the journey to healing can happen mm. and then you know like i look at my journey of you know 15 years of like active addiction you know, and not that I see it as a waste because it's a it's a valuable part of my journey. But if I disclosed earlier, I probably wouldn't have needed to go down that path. Mm. And, and on one level, I'm glad I did because of the level of empathy and compassion that mm. I have now for people that are in an active addiction. Mm. Um, but wow, I, I often think if only I'd disclosed ten years earlier, mm. what could have been different? Mm. I don't want to dwell too much on that. But the sooner we disclose quicker the journey happens. Mm. You know, I like what you said then because um, sometimes we can go into their face, oh, I should have done this earlier, blah, blah, blah. But spinning it around, as you said, actually, I learned a lot. And part of it is, okay, what have you learned? Mm -hmm. How do you, how does that better you? Yeah. How does that help, well, the community? The community. Yeah. I have a lot of clients that are in either in active addiction or you know are in recovery, and yeah. you know, they're talking to someone that's been through the same journey as them. I'm like, I know what it's like to put a needle in my arm. Mm. I know what it's like to be that out of it that I don't even know where I am. I know what it's like to be in such a way. I've put myself in situations that are dangerous mm. because of my need at the time to, to, to get drugs. Mm. You know, the, I look back sometimes, I'm like, how did I manage to live through all of that? Mm. But then you can sit in front of someone and when you share that story, it means that they can then share theirs and be like, 
well, here's a brother that's been through the same thing as I am, is not judging himself. Mm. It's not going to judge me. It means that I can speak into it. Mm. And then it kind of, ha- and then they see someone that's been through, you know, an ex-sex worker living on the streets, drug addict, you know, most people's mind, end of story, mm. no hope whatsoever. Mm. And then they look at me and they're like, well, but you managed to yeah. come out the other end. Right. What did you do? I can do that. I can do that. If you're an example... You know, yeah, then I can do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it gives me another story. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is about, um, actually, it's my daughter. She won't mind me saying that. Mm-hmm. She was, she worked in the corporate world. Yeah. Right. But she'd come home and um, onto Marae, and she'd be still dressed in her suit and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Put on her apron and cook fry bread. All right. And um, <laughs> the nephews go, who's that? Oh, that's your cousin Naomi. What? what? You mean I can do that? Mm-hmm. I can come from where we are yeah. to there? She goes, all you have to do is don't go to school to eat your lunch mm-hmm. type thing yeah. and work hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you give them the example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because when people find out my official role, so technically I'm the general manager of the of the agency. Yep. And people turn up in the, welling, uh, the hut office and I'm usually in shorts and bare feet in a t-shirt, yep. all my tattoos are all showing, and people look at me and go, you're the general manager? And I'm walking around in bare feet, sitting on the floor, but, you yeah. know, all the titles and all that is irrelevant to me. Yep. It's actually, I'm, for me, I'm an example of what yeah, yeah. everyone can move to, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't keep yourself locked in your cage. <laughs> the door's open. Door's open. You just have to walk through. My office door's always open, yeah. never closed. Yeah, yeah. And a bit like your daughter, you know, I'm, I'm putting the apron on. Doing the mahi. Doing the mahi and making the bread. And <laughs> <laughs> That's why my, my midsection's getting bigger. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I hear you, I hear you. It's, time's getting on and it's gone fast. I know, right? <laughs> fantastic. I mean, every minute of this, whatever. Hey, you said, uh, is there any music? <laughs> yes. You did sing a little bit. I did. Um, but... Um, I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it like this. Um, for this part here, right. I'm going to end it like this. So you said um, how you lift your sessions at the end. Um, you say what you're grateful for, okay, or something that you've learned. Mm. So for this part, how I'm going to close it down, and um, for those listeners out there, also, I'd like you to do the same in your own space. Talk about, out loud, one thing you're grateful for or one thing that you've learned, okay, in your own space. So we'll start with you, Tony, and then we'll come back to me. I'm grateful for you reaching out to me in that initial meeting and saying, come on, let's come and have a chat. And so that I'm grateful for because I've had, I don't know how long we've been here, it feels like five seconds, but it's probably longer. <laughs> but I'm really grateful to have this level of conversation. Cool. Yeah. Kia, ora. Kia, ora. Kia ora. I'm grateful for the opportunity to actually be here to listen in. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Taylor. Yep. Thank you. Susie. Mm, what am I grateful for? There's, I've got a whole list of things. Okay, so we're not going to take all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, um, I guess I'm grateful um, to have lived this long and um, have a lot of background on, you know, if people ask me for help, I know where where to sort of navigate, I love that word navigator, um, and support people in, in need of, of whatever, and it's been fantastic to meet you guys. It's, um, me too. It's fabulous to know in our community that we have so many agencies mm. um, around that can help. Yeah. Um, and meeting like this, as you say, it's great just to be able to um, explain what you do because, you know, lots of people will be listening to this and, and now I know what you do as well, which I've been sitting there in awe of of, of what you're doing um, for people. So it's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm grateful for, communication and, um, you know, the sharing of experiences and being able to support people and connect. Mm. Yeah. Mm, okay. Before I say what I'm grateful for, the learning I had, I'd like um, your contact 
details again, just yep. so if anyone's out there who needs to, uh, who would like to um, contact um, Tony or any one of his team. Yeah, uh, so www.theroadforward.org.nz, uh, the same on Instagram and the same on Facebook. Okay. You know, and if, if you can't remember that, support at the road forward, it will land on one of our desks as an email. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And should you forget those things, contact us on that's age concern on um, 06 377 0066. <laughs> He's trying to read my mind. <laughs> I actually wrote that down because sometimes when people go, oh, what's that number? And you go, oh, I've got like a million numbers in my head. <laughs> so yeah, no contact us and we'll put you in contact uh, with the road forward. And so what I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for people who are willing, or who have courage and who are brave to stand up and say, I've had enough. And to know that other people um, need help and put their hand up again and say, pick me, pick me, I'll go, I'll go. Mm. So it reminds me of, um, and I'm going to say this, people going to war, mm, who sacrifice what their lives that we might live. And at the end of the day, that we might live. Bye. Mm. So kia ora, um, both um, Tony and Taylor, uh, for coming over, driving over here, taking the time to share with us um, your experiences and what you do um, in our community and for our community. So um, kia ora, kia ora kōrua. All right, the last part of our session is, don't forget, we've got a expo, is that right, Susie? When yeah, we it? do have an expo on the 17th of March, um, so that's quite exciting and uh, something interesting for everyone, I would think. Uh, Ginny is very um, busy at the moment, uh, organising people to come along to that and yeah, hopefully have a lot of um, opportunities to engage in an activity, which will be really fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's held at the... Um the Trust House Recreation Centre, the two um, Dixon Street here in Masterton, come along. It's on a Friday from ten to three o'clock, I think it is. There's going to be MIS. They're going to be doing some uh, kapahaka and poly dancing. Uh, that'll be great. I've seen them. They're awesome. So please come along. And there'll be also stores there um, that will be helpful though for those like me getting older uh, um, to support me in my old age or our old age. Mm. And also for those people that are supporting. Um, people in their old age too because you know it comes to all of us in the end so it's always good to have a, a few uh, cues and um, you know things in your kitty that you can reach out to and um, yeah develop and yeah have fun. I'll finish on this last but it goes like this <clears throat> this is an older person talking to a younger person where you are now once I was but where I am now one day you may be so remember me, remember me. Fano kia ora koutou, and I'm here kia ora Have a great day. Um, remember, we're aging with attitude. <laughs> See you next month. Hey, Kornita. Matiwa. <laughs>